Thank you, Enrico, for the introduction. That was really generous, too much. So um, my job today is, um, is trying to <clears throat> explain why are we interested in uh, genome sequencing, next generation sequencing, in a field uh, that is actually uh, related to therapy, which is, uh, as uh, Enrico said, uh, gene therapy. Uh, the title that you see on these slides is actually different from what you saw on the program, but it's really uh, the uh, main message uh, of my presentation today. That is, how can we use uh, viruses to understand the human genome? And um, uh, as, um, as I said, the, the whole thing started from um, from gene therapy, and uh, I will not uh, really give you uh, too much information today, uh, but just uh, uh, as an introduction. Uh, we, we and many others started almost 20 years ago uh, transducing stem cells uh, for the purpose of curing genetic disorders. And uh, here you see a classical scheme in which uh, you essentially uh, introduce uh, uh, viruses in, uh, in uh, hematopoietic stem cells and transplant them autologously in patients with the uh, idea of uh, uh, treating genetic disorders. Uh, this was not just an idea, uh, and actually during the years, uh, this became uh, an, uh, an important platform and in, in some cases led to uh, cure of uh, uh, rare genetic disorders like severe combined immunodeficiencies. Uh, this slide is just to remind you that uh, uh, ADA uh, deficient and ex-kid uh, uh, were uh, among the first uh, genetic diseases that were treated by transplantation of genetically modified cells and uh, uh, with, uh, with some success. And, um, and since we are uh, almost uh, uh, among friends here, uh, I will dare to show you the, the, the group of people that uh, at the beginning of the 90s uh, uh, you should recognize your speaker today in this picture, uh, started with uh, gene therapy of ADA, and uh, uh, more recently, uh, the group of uh, uh, hematologists and immunologists at the San Rafael Institute, this is Alessandro Iuti, uh, that uh, uh, transformed uh, our first uh, uh, technology and uh, first experiments into uh, real therapy. Uh, unfortunately, not everything works in this, uh, in, in this type of technology, and uh, there were uh, severe side effects uh, due to the use of viruses uh, uh, in, uh, um, to, to transduce the uh, therapeutic genes. Uh, we were all using retroviruses, vectors derived from retroviruses, and uh, uh, the uh, severe side effect that was observed in some of the patients, uh, not our patients, fortunately, um, was the insertion of uh, the vector that carried the therapeutic genes into the genome in the wrong place. And the wrong place is, uh, unfortunately, proto-oncogenes. Uh, virologists already know, since probably 40 years, that insertion of uh, uh, viruses into proto-oncogenes can lead to uh, activation of those genes and, uh, to, and to cancer. And this is actually the lesson that we relearned uh, during these years, and uh, the insertion of the therapeutic vectors, in some cases, uh, in known proto-oncogenes like LMO2 in, the, in this case, led to the occurrence of leukemia in some of the treated uh, uh, patients. Uh, this, um, the frequency by which this event occurred, that was totally unexpected, uh, led some geneticists involved in gene therapy, including uh, myself and my group, to uh, try to understand uh, what are actually the characteristics uh, of the uh, integration properties of these vectors in the human genome and try to understand uh, why these uh, events are apparently so frequent and, uh, and what can we learn from that. And from this point, um, I would try to give you in, in, in less than half an hour um, uh, an idea of what we learned and uh, uh, the technology that we used uh, and that we learned to, uh, to use uh, to, to study uh, this uh, host pathogen, if you wish, uh, interactions, and, uh, um, and how we think we can use uh, what we learned uh, for a completely different purpose. So uh, the idea was, uh, if, you, if you get 
cells, uh, either before or uh, after transplantation into patients. And uh, um, maybe I can use the pointer, yeah. And, um, um, and you extract DNA from these cells. Um, the question is, where, where is the vector uh, going into the genome? And um, to, to understand to this question, you use a technology that is called link-immediated PCR. It's a PCR-based technology. It's essentially, it's, it's very simple. You just cut the genome with a, a frequent cutter restriction enzyme. Uh, you uh, add a, a linker to these uh, cohesive hands, and then you amplify with nested primers sequences uh, starting from the linker and from uh, uh, the LTR, uh, the, the, ex the extremity uh, of the uh, retroviral vector. So uh, in doing this, you essentially amplify libraries of sequences, um, of genomic sequences adjacent to the vector insertion sites. Uh, you can uh, um, make libraries of these sequences, you can sequence these uh, sequences, blast them, and essentially come out with, uh, uh, with a library of uh, um, insertion points in the genome, and, uh, and then you analyze them, taking advantage of the uh, known sequence of the human genome. This was originally done uh, when we started several years ago uh, manually by Sanger sequencing, uh, and, uh, and we already uh, understood uh, with this uh, uh, still simple uh, way of analyzing uh, things uh, that uh, uh, insertion sites of uh, retroviruses, the uh, MLV virus, for instance, uh, are these um, uh, red uh, lollipops uh, uh, on the human chromosomes, are, are not at all random, but they're actually clustered and clustered in regions where uh, there are genes. Not only that, but when we analyzed uh, bioinformatically the uh, sequences adjacent to the uh, vector insertion sites, we realized that we are full of transcription factor binding sites and uh, leading us to, uh, uh, to, to think uh, that uh, not only uh, uh, vectors land in the human genome where, uh, where there are genes, but also uh, and probably most frequently where there are regulatory sequences. Uh, the, um, and this was just an example that was published in, two nine, uh, in 2009 that uh, shows that the, um, the transcription factor binding sites adjacent to the uh, uh, vector um, insertion sites are uh, uh, really uh, real and uh, related to the biological properties of the target cells, in this case, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So uh, the whole picture changed uh, when uh, uh, next generation sequencing became available because, of course, uh, the more uh, sequences you, you uh, sequence and analyze, the, the more uh, you understand um, of uh, this type of biological phenomenon. And we, um, we came into this field very early thanks to the collaborations with uh, Gianluca De Bellis that uh, uh, was uh, the first in Italy to, uh, to use uh, pyrosequencing. And we uh, started to collaborate to, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, and, um, and essentially, the, the scheme uh, is the same. Uh, you analyze cells, you uh, build uh, these LMPCR libraries, but instead of uh, doing banal sequencing, you uh, feed these machines and, uh, and you uh, derive uh, much, much more information out of that. Um, this is just uh, an example of the first uh, work that was published at the end of uh, last year that we did on, uh, on hematopoietic stem cells uh, with two different types of viruses um, uh, to derived from the MLV, from the murine leukemia virus, or the HIV. And we essentially uh, started uh, extensively integration sites in the, in the human genome. This is just an example on chromosome one, and uh, it shows that, uh, as I said before, integrations are clustered. Oh, these are all peak in red, MLV, in blue, HIV, uh, of insertions into chromosome one. The random would be the dotted black line here. This is the centrosome. Um, and as you see, um, there are uh, regions where the vector goes uh, very frequently, either the MLV here, for instance, or the HIV here, for instance, uh, regions where any vector would go very frequently, and regions where there is basically no integration. Um, why is this? Well, because vec viruses have preferences. They don't go randomly into a human genome. Uh, for instance, uh, MLV, uh, likes uh, to go uh, close to uh, transcription start site, which means close to promoters, and as you will see in a second, regulatory sequences. HIV doesn't like promoters, but instead lands uh, most frequently into genes, into uh, transcribed genes. These are the, the blue uh, uh, bars here. Uh, and uh, when, to, to, 
to understand this, we s simply annotated all the sequences that came out of the machine um, as intergenic or intragenic or close to proximal. This is things that uh, uh, any student in bioinformatics now can do uh, very rapidly and in, in automated fashions, uh, even if it works with uh, tens of thousands of sequences, like in this case. Um, as I said, we analyzed tens of thousands of sequences, and, and um, we learned a, a, a number of lessons. The, the first is that um, uh, MLV, these are um, frequency peaks of integrations in, an, in a normalized uh, uh, gene. So here is the start site of the gene, here is the end of the genes. Uh, the, any genes, is the, 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 the length of the gene has been normalized in 50 different beans. So, um, as you see, obviously, there is an enrichment of integrations of the Maloney vector close to the transcription start sites, whereas the HIV uh, is actually decreased in this region and goes more uh, along the um, uh, transcribed portion of the gene. You can see this much better if you move upstream of the gene, so the transcription start site would be in this place, this is the gene, this is upstream of the gene, as, and as you see, there is a peak of insertions of Maloney right in this place. Um, you can zoom in and look at taking advantages of the uh, number of uh, sequences that have been generated by the 454. These are the actual numbers here. Um, and actually look more carefully at promoters regions, which are uh, really very important. And then you see this uh, mirror image here that shows the mirror behaviors of these two viruses. So MLV really likes uh, to, to, to land um, uh, around uh, transcription start sites. HIV uh, really doesn't like it. Um, and um, again, if you zoom even more in, you realize that this um, uh, double peak here is, uh, is simply generated by the fact that the basal promoter is occupied by the transcription and machinery. So there is basically no insertions where uh, the, uh, the basal promoter is occupied and TF2D and uh, uh, the polymerase uh, essentially um, take place, uh, whereas uh, um, the integrations are very much abundant all around. This says two things. First, that uh, promoters are targeted by MLV. Second, that promoters targeted by MLV are occupied by the basal transcription machinery, uh, thus explaining why in integration does not occur uh, where there is steric hindrance, where the vector simply cannot access the genome. Uh, this is true. Um, well, first of all, um, the fact that the, the targeted genes are, uh, are actually expressed, uh, we, we have verified that by doing simple affimetric analysis on, uh, um, on the target cells. And uh, we uh, simply realized, you don't really need to go into the de details of these slides, which is pretty complicated, but uh, if in uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells half of the genes are uh, active and uh, transcribed, and after the genes are not transcribed by affimetric analysis, if you simply look at the uh, group of genes that are targeted by the vector, you immediately realize that 90% of those are actually active. So promoters are occupied, genes are transcribed, um, and uh, not only the, vector go, uh, the vectors go where uh, promoters are, but where also where other regulatory regions are. This, for instance, are CPG islands, or conserved non-coding sequences, evolutionary conserved non-coding sequences. These are all, um, let's say, uh, surrogate definitions of uh, enhancers and promoters and regulatory regions in general in the genome. So the, what emerges from, from these type of pictures is that the uh, vectors derived from the uh, MLV virus, but not from the HIV virus, have a dramatic preference for inserting uh, where the action is in the genome, so essentially in promoters and regulatory regions. And this is an example, uh, and this is, is a, the right example probably, it's the, the LMO2 locus. So if you look at the high definition mapping of these sequences, of these insertion sequences in the LMO2 locus, uh, which is very well known, uh, this is the, the gene as two uh, different promoters, one here, one here, and these uh, orange boxes are mapped uh, in um, regulatory regions in these genes that have been extensively studied by many groups 
in the last uh, decade, um, you, you realize that uh, um, the clusters of MLV insertion sites, these uh, red um, uh, lines here, uh, one here, one here, one here, essentially coincides and co-map with the regulatory elements. So, so therefore, validating the idea that uh, uh, really MLV lands where regulatory elements are. Uh, these, for instance, are uh, sequences that regulate hematopoietic precursors that are uh, clearly targeted by MLV, and these are uh, other sequences that are less targeted in this set. So um, how can we uh, understand whether this is true genome-wide? Um, because, of course, we don't know all the regulatory sequences in the genome. Well, um, as I said, um, if you um, imagine this is a vector inserted close to a regulatory region and answer of promoters, these are transcription factor binding sites. Well, if this um, uh, region is active, so it's working and uh, used by the cell, um, there will be transcription factor binding sites and the basal transcription machinery uh, bound to them. Um, how can we be sure this is the case? Well, we can precipitate uh, chromatin by antibodies uh, against some of these factors or cofactors if we know them. Or we can use a surrogate um, uh, analysis, which is essentially looking uh, in the proximity of the insertion site and uh, precipitating uh, chromatin with uh, antibodies that mark um, histones that are either acetylated or methylated in, uh, uh, with characteristics uh, modifications uh, of uh, active regulatory regions. Um, if you precipitate chromatin and then you uh, essentially uh, look at uh, um, MLV target sequences, and you can do this in two ways. Uh, one that we uh, attempted a couple of years ago is uh, uh, chip on chip analysis. So since we knew uh, many of these insertion sites, um, uh, insertion sites like this, we built um, uh, custom arrays uh, of oligos, tiled oligos, that essentially span plus minus 1,000 base pairs from each insertion site. And we built what we called uh, this integrome arrays. So arrays that contains oligos that represents a large number of uh, MLV insertion sites. And then we immunoprecipitated precipitated the chromatin with antibodies against different acetylations and methylations, uh, asking the questions, are these uh, modifications enriched in the regions of the genomes where the vector lands with respect to other regions? And to uh, make a long story short, uh, this uh, is the uh, outcome of this time of experiment. So there are controls. Uh, uh, sequence targeted by MLV, sequence targeted by HIV, they behave very differently. Bottom line is that the uh, methylations and acetylation that are characteristics of uh, uh, promoters and enhancers, like those that you see here, uh, or uh, histone variants that are uh, actually associated to uh, used enhancers, are strongly enriched in the regions where the MLV uh, vector goes. And, and actually not enriched at all where, where the HIV uh, goes, which is interesting also for the virologists in the audience here. Um, you can do this by chip and chip analysis or uh, if chip, se uh, chip sequencing data are available and they uh, became available recently uh, for these specific cells, uh, you can study correlations between insertion sites and chip sequencing data. Um, again, I don't have the time to, to go uh, too much into the details of this, but just uh, the, 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 the bottom line is that um, Modifications like this, so monomethylation of histone 3 uh, lysine 4 or 3 methylation of histone 3 lysine 4 uh, or polymerase 2 binding are obviously uh, enriched uh, in the uh, surrounding of the MLV insertion sites. They aren't in the surrounding of HIV insertion sites uh, with, where other features are present, which I don't have the time to uh, go through uh, in detail today. So uh, again, um, uh, the bottom line is that uh, uh, where there are uh, promoters, enhancers, chromatin modifications, epigenetic landscape that is characteristics of uh, transcription, uh, you have enrichment of uh, MLV insertion sites. So this is interesting for gene therapy. So we know now that the vectors that we use go uh, really in the wrong place of the genome. So in the places where it's probably uh, easier to, uh, uh, to, to do the wrong thing, which is deregulate genes and possibly oncogenes. But it's also interesting for uh, 
for the reverse uh, uh, objective, which I will try to explain in, in the uh, last part of my um, talk. So as I said, um, um, insertion side of MLV essentially identify uh, uh, promoters and regulatory regions uh, marked by uh, chromatin modifications like this trimethylation of Eastern 3K4 in the genome. When we know that these are promoters and regulatory regions, well, we, we can just correlate this and rediscover that this, for instance, is the promoter of EVA1B uh, and, uh, and accessory regulatory sequences. But there are cases, of course, in which we don't have any idea where uh, uh, promoters and enhancers are. So, so um, we started to, uh, to think, can we actually use this um, viruses as genome scanners? Can we actually uh, use them to identify regulatory regions that we don't know? And um, I will give you uh, uh, a couple of examples. Uh, this is the CD34 locus, um, uh, which is obviously expressed in uh, hematopoietic progenitors. And these are three different regions uh, that um, are identified by peaks of MLV integrations. Two of these are known enhancers, one here and one here. This is probably a promoter. So we know enough of these genes, and again, this is another validation of the concept. What happens if we don't know uh, where, where, where um, uh, an answer starts? And this is one example. EV1 is an important gene in, uh, uh, in the uh, hematopoietic stem cell biology. Um, and as you can see here, the gene is uh, down here. Um, there are two regions that are clearly identified by MLV integrations in our experiments and in patients that map to these regions whose function is totally unknown. But uh, from what we learned uh, from uh, the gene and low site in which the function of the enhancers and the location of enhancers and promoters are known, these are candidate enhancer sequences for this uh, gene. Um, the same is true for CD133, which is a marker of uh, pluripotent um, uh, hematopoietic precursors. And again, uh, the, oops, what happened here? I don't know what happened here. Hello? How do I go back to the slide? This is the fun, funny thing. Apple computers. OK, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, this, uh, again, uh, is, is, a, is a large cluster of sequences that, that co-map with monomethylation of Eastern 3K4 that are most likely a major enhancer for the transcription of these genes that could possibly be identified by this type of analysis. And this doesn't go on anymore. Hello? Help. Non vanno avanti né indietro. Ok. This is what I was trying to say. Um, so, this is our putative regulatory regions of genes uh, for which we don't know uh, pretty much anything. And this is another example just to show that uh, these uh, peaks of integrations not only um, are surrounded by very specific uh, epigenetic marks of uh, enhancers and promoters, but also come up with binding sites for uh, uh, transcription factors, in this case SCL that uh, have been identified. So it, it is probably easier to predict that this would be an answer bound by SCL in this locus, and FE2 is another uh, important gene in blood stem cells. And this probably would be, uh, this region would span a, a major regulatory regions for this gene. So um, um, if you actually look at the genes um, that are targeted by vectors, uh, you realize, probably at this point as expected, that these genes are all functionally related. So you can use uh, fancy um, uh, pathway analysis uh, uh, programs like, uh, like this one to actually look at relationship, functional relationship within genes targeted 
by these uh, vectors, and you immediately realize that uh, these are all uh, targeted genes in uh, uh, CD34 plus uh, hematopoietic precursors, uh, progenitors, and you immediately realize that all these genes are linked in functional networks that are characteristics of these cells. This is true for any other cell. So we are applying this uh, technology to, to study different types of cells, uh, T cells, T lymphocytes in this case, and again, all these uh, target genes are linked in networks that have very much to do with the biology of these cells, like uh, IL-21 receptor and F-kappa-B, or interesting things that you might recognize in this slide. Uh, or if you do this in keratinocytes, uh, for instance, it's another cells in which we are very much interested, uh, you will find laminins or genes that are important for the biology of these cells. So basically, you can use this technique to analyze functionally genomes and regulatory, genes and regulatory elements in the genome of pretty much any cell, and um, basically come up with the same type of conclusions. Uh, this is another association study with epigenetic modifications that we did in T cells, and very interesting, not only we found essentially the same things that we found already, so that uh, MLV is linked, uh, is, is characterized, by uh, epigenetic modification, the uh, characteristic of promoters and enhancers, but are also bound by um, uh, chromatin modified, like P300, PCAF, and CBP, uh, very uh, strongly. So regions where uh, chromatin uh, and transcription factors and regulatory elements uh, actually recruit modifier uh, of uh, chromatin that could actually even be the targets of integrations. Um, this, uh, uh, these insertions, these targets, these clusters are obviously cell-specific. I will show only one example of this. Um, this is, the, again, the LMO2 gene. Uh, the cluster that has been identified in CD34 cells is, is not present in T cells, which are down here. Um, instead, if you analyze T cell genome with this type of technology, you uh, find clusters that are not present in CD34 cells, like this one, that are actually characteristics of uh, T cell genes, like the uh, IL-2 uh, receptor. And I could do many, many other examples of this. For the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, through this, uh, but I would rather uh, give you an idea of why we think that this is happening and why we think that this could be a genomic tool for, for analyze functionally the human genomes. So, uh, we know very little of the molecular mechanisms that uh, basically uh, define the integration preferences of viruses. Um, we know um, uh, actually uh, quite a good amount of information for the HIV virus, but not very much for this type of viruses. So um, what we learned is that um, uh, MLV pre-integration complexes, which is this peak uh, uh, that you see here and here, PIC means pre-integration complexes, somehow do not go randomly to the genome, but go where regulatory elements are. How is this possibly brought about? Uh, well, one possibility is that uh, uh, regions that are occupied by the transcriptional machinery, like in this uh, case, this an answer, you will have uh, transcription factor, cofactors, mediator complex, histone acetyl transferase, methyl transferase, any, anything. So one possibility is that these pre-integration complexes recognize these regions in the genome. They are actually tethered to the genome by uh, uh, interacting with this uh, machinery. Or, as an alternative, uh, when they enter into the nucleus, they're actually bound by transcription factors and cofactors. And by, after this binding, they are brought to chromatin. We cannot distinguish between these two uh, possibilities at the moment. But the, the consequence of this is that the integration, since the pre-integration complex is tethered to chromatin by functional complexes, occurs in the vicinity of functional complexes and therefore um, are enriched in regulatory regions and we think can be used to identify regulatory regions. Um, this is the same thing twice, just for you to understand better. Um, this is not unprecedented, and I will just conclude my uh, talk with a uh, couple of hypotheses. And uh, it is known, for instance, in, uh, in a very related family of move movable sequences, which are yeast retrotransposons, uh, 
Uh, East retrotransposons are evolutionarily very much related to retroviruses. Uh, they, the integrase, uh, the retroviral integrase of Moloney, for instance, is, is quite similar to the retrotransposase. And it has been known for, for years that retrotransposons, this family of retrotransposons, the Thai family of retrotransposons in yeast, um, go very precisely into the yeast genome. They integrate very closely and precisely around uh, the transcription start site of polymerase three regulated genes. Uh, we were talking before polymerase two regulated genes. So there is a precedent for this. And the one possibility is that uh, the uh, retroviral integrase have evolved from retrotransposases by uh, uh, evolving their um, integrase uh, sequence uh, for tethering their integrations, not in pole three uh, regions like in this case, but actually in pole two regions. And this for the virus would be uh, evolutionary uh, very advantageous. Um, by uh, directing integrations into active regions of the genomes, the virus uh, can actually make sure that this genome can be transcribed. Not only that, but for leukemia viruses, for oncogenic viruses, uh, inserting into regulatory regions is probably also uh, a way to induce proliferations and amplifications of infected cell clones. And uh, from the point of view of the retrovirus, this, of course, would be advantageous. What we can do while we are learning this uh, uh, type of characteristics of these viruses is use them uh, as another tool to analyze functionally genomes and actually uh, use integromes to uh, uh, identify regulatory regions in the genome. And I will just conclude by saying that we are using in the laboratory now extensively this type of technologies, for instance, to address issues of commitment and uh, uh, differentiation of uh, embryonic stem cells or neural stem cells and other type of things, in which, of course, we identify completely different genes, like the Hox genes or the, the, these genes, uh, PIF1 down here, and regulatory elements that uh, could probably be uh, very interesting for uh, anybody interested in uh, stem cell biology. Uh, let me, well, I said this already, uh, I don't need to repeat the conclusions, let me conclude by acknowledging uh, the contribution of the many people that helped us in the last three years uh, for this type of work, uh, people in uh, uh, the Center for the Regenerative Medicine in, here in Modena, um, and in particular, uh, Giulietta, Francesca, Anna Rita, and Alessandra Recchia. Um, and uh, people in the, at the San Rafael Institute in Milano, I already uh, uh, said that uh, we, we, we cannot do this without the help of Gianluca De Bellis uh, at the CNR in Milano, and without the help of the uh, group of very talented bioinformaticians uh, in uh, Milan again, that helped us to uh, build the pipeline for analysis of these uh, hundreds of thousands of sequences that have been analyzed during this day. And uh, these are some of the people that, uh, uh, well, actually the most important people. This is Claudia Cattoglio actually verifying that the DNA uh, that she's sequencing was uh, the right one here. This is uh, Alessandra Recchia, who is now uh, a permanent uh, investigator in this university. And this is Serenella, our very talented technician. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fulvio. Uh, certo, domande anche in italiano. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, question: We um, unfortunately are, are on delay, but uh, but please, uh, if you are, if you have some question, please. Oh, so, sorry, Maria. Hi. I would like to ask you about species specificity of retrovirus integration. Is there any, so the, the experiments you mentioned are made in human cells? Yes. Or not? And is there any difference between the different species? Great question. Um, apparently in mammalian cells there is no difference. If you uh, analyze the mouse genome, you basically come up with the same type of conclusions. Um, if you move away from mammalian genomes, it becomes dif difficult because viruses do not infect non-mammalian, well, um, these viruses. So, but it's obviously a very, very important point. Uh, we, we, we really don't know uh, what this uh, machinery would recognize in lower invertebrates, for instance, 
where some of the characteristics of the transcriptional machinery could be different.